Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear students. Welcome to my class. This is lecture number 11. In this class, we will be discussing the major reforms introduced by Lord Cornwallis once he became the Governor General of India. Lord Cornwallis was sent to India as the next Governor General, succeeding Warren Hastings in 1786. He was sent to India especially to maintain the peace which enshrined in the Pitts India Act of 1784. In addition to that, he was also required to find solutions to the problems of land revenue administration and he was required to introduce an efficient judicial system and reorganize the commercial department of the company. With these intentions in mind, Lord Convalis was sent to India as the Governor General in 1786. Before he was sent from Britain to India, certain amendments were made in the Pitts India Act of 1784, under which the powers of both the governor general and the commander in chief of the army would be vested with him. That Lord Convalis who would enjoy both the powers of the governor general as well as the commander in chief of the army. He was also given the right to override the majority decisions taken at the Supreme Council concerning administration and military matters. With these extraordinary powers, Lord Cornwallis landed in India. He served in India as the Governor General from 1786 to 1793 during his first period. His notable achievements were in the field of judicial administration, especially criminal administrative system. In the judicial system, he introduced reforms three times. The first time he introduced judicial reforms in 1787, it was followed in 1790 after the gap of three years. His third reform was introduced in 1793. The reform, the judicial reforms introduced by Lord Cornwallis came into known as judicial plan of 1789, 1790 and 1793. Now, we are going to see what reforms Lord Cornwallis made in the judicial administration during these three times. First of all, let us look at the judicial reforms Lord Cornwallis introduced through his first plan in 1789. In 1789, he made the collectors who had firstly been appointed by Warren Hastings in charge of the district judges of the Diwani Adalat. The collectors were made the judge, district judges of the Diwani Adalat. Diwani Adalat was a court which is settled civil disputes. These collectors were given both magisterial and administrative powers and they were also empowered to try 
cases with certain limits. Thus, Lord Cornwall is made the collectors in charge of the districts with magisterial powers. His next plan, judicial plan, was introduced in 1790. What changes did he introduce through this judicial plan of 1790? He abolished the district Fauchidari Adalats. As you now recall that district Fauchidari Adalats were caught at a district level which settled criminal cases. Likewise, Diwani Adalat, district Diwani Adalat settled civil cases, Fauchidari Adalat decided criminal cases. During the period of Warren Hastings, these Fauchidari Adalats were presided over by Indian officers. They heard the cases with the support of Kosi and Mufti. But now, in 1790, Lord Cornwall is abolished the district criminal court of Fauchidari Adalat. In the place of Fauchidari Adalat, he created four circuit courts, which he used to visit the district headquarters twice a year for settling criminal cases. He created totally four circuit courts, three for Bengal and one for Bihar. The circuit courts were created for settling criminal cases. Who did preside over these circuit courts? In Fauchidari courts, Indian officers had presided, while on this other hand, the circuit courts were presided over by European Covenanted Service, higher civil service officers only presided over the circuit courts. Likewise, the Fauchidari Adalat of the period of the Warren Hastings, the circuit court also heard cases with the help of Kwasi and Mufti. Another change he introduced was that Sadar Nisamad Adalat at Murshidabad from Fauchidari Adalat appeals were lay to Sadar Nisamad Adalat during the period of Warren Hastings. But Lord Cornwallis replaced the Sadar Nisamad Adalat at Murshidabad by a similar court at Calcutta. But Sadar Nisamad Adalat would be presided over by the Governor General and other members of the Supreme Council at Calcutta. The Sadar Nisamat Adalat, which was replaced by a similar court like Sadar Nisamat Adalat in Calcutta, but this time this court was to be presided over by none other than the Governor General and other three members of the Supreme Council also comprised the part of this Sadar Nisamat Adalat. It also decided cases with the support of Kwasi and two Muftis. Now, coming to judicial plans of 1793, what changes did he introduce in judiciary in 1793? In 1793, he separated the two branches, revenue administration from the judicial administration. In 1787, both these powers were concentrated in the hands of the district collector, who acted as well as the head of the revenue administration and decided criminal and civil cases to a certain extent. Now, the district collector was made the head of the revenue department. He took away his judicial and magisterial powers of the district collector and he was exclusively to be dealt with the revenue administration of the district. Judicial and civil power, judicial and magisterial powers were taken away from 
the district collector and these powers they are vested with another officer called a district judge. He was it to be preside over the district court and in 1793 a gradation of or an hierarchy of court Lord Corn Valley set up at the lowest level municipal courts were created. These municipal courts were presided over by the Indian officers. These municipal court decided cases involving Rs 50 rupees. Above the municipal court, Lord Corn Valley created registrar's court. The registrar's court was to be presided over by European officers. It decided cases up to 200 rupees. Above the registrar court in 1793 he created district courts, appeals from municipal courts and registrar courts led to district courts. It was presided over by the judges, district judges. This post was created in 1793 by Lord Cornwallis by divesting the powers of the district collector of magisterial as well as judicial. The district court decided civil cases with the support of the Indians who were well versed in legal system. Above the district court, he created provincial courts. This pro, there were four provincial courts of appeal. These provincial courts were set up at Calcutta, Murshidabad, Dhaka and Patna. These provincial courts entertained appeals from the district courts. It decided civil cases up to 1000 rupees. All these courts used it to settle civil disputes. Criminal justice is different, we will be coming to that. Under this, this provincial court decided on civil cases up to 1000 rupees. In this provincial court also European judges presided over this provincial court of appeal. Sadar Diwani Adalat which was the highest court relating to civil disputes. Appeals from provincial courts were lay to Sadar Diwani Adalat. Sadar Diwani Adalat was presided over by the Governor General and all other members of the Supreme Council were also the part of this Sadar Diwani Adalat. It heard appeals from provincial courts of 1000 rupees and above. But in all civil disputes involving 5000 British pound and above appeals led to king in council in Britain. These civil cases involving 5000 5, British pound were not settled at Sadar Diwani Adalat, but appeals on these cases were led to king's council in Britain. In civil cases, Muhammadan law was administered for the Muslims and Hindu law was made applicable for the Hindus in civil cases. And it was also for the first time, government servants were also made responsible to answer to the civil court for the actions done by them under their official capacity. Thus, Lord Cornwallis maintain the sovereignty of law. 
Now coming to criminal administration, what changes did he introduce in criminal administrative system? You recall that district Fauchidari Adalats, which had been created during the period of Warren Hastings. Lord Convalis abolished this district Fauchidari Adalats and the petty criminal cases now began to be tried in district judges court. Above the district judges court, there were circuit courts for settling criminal cases of serious nature. Four circuit courts were created. They also decided the criminal cases with the support of Kosi and Mufti. These circuit courts would award death punishment as well as life imprisonment. Sadar Nisamad Adalat, which was the highest court of appeal in Bengal regarding to criminal cases. It was also presided over by Governor General. Governor General enjoyed commutation of sentences awarded by Sadar Nisamad Adalat. Through the regulation of 9 of 1793, now the non-Muslims got the opportunity to give evidences against the Muslims in criminal cases. Earlier it was not possible in Muhammadan or Shariat law. Now this system came into an end under this new system even Hindus were able to give evidences against the Muslims in criminal cases. Now the cases began to be heard based on evidence, evidence was given more importance in the judgment. Earlier the amputation of limbs of the culprits were used, but it was replaced, amputation of the limbs of the body of the culprit was abolished under this new system temporary hard labor or fine or imprisonment according to the circumstances of the case were introduced. And again according to Shariat or Muhammadan law, compensation of money for the murder was possible. Now it was abolished compensation of money as price of blood was abolished once for all. Now coming to an evaluation of the judicial system introduced by Lord Convalis, it was based on the principle of equity and the western conception of justice, equality of law and the rule of law were given importance by Lord Convalis. He also codified secular laws. Earlier there had been in existence religious laws, but it was replaced by secular laws which Lord Convalis had codified. The rule of law was proclaimed and it was also for the first time government officials were also made answerable to the court for the acts done by them in their official capacity. However, there were certain inherent defects in the judicial system introduced by Lord Convalis. One delay in disposal of cases because the number of litigation increased leading to the pendency of cases. Then all the judicial functionaries before the arrival of the British judicial powers were vested in the Panjaits, Semintars, Kosi, Fauchidar and Nazim. 
they lost their judicial powers. Now, it began to be built up by the judges appointed by the British. The superior courts, in superior courts, the judges, only the Europeans would become the judges in superior courts. They were ignorant of the customs and the habits of the Indians. Now, coming to the major police reforms, Lord Cornwall is introduced. He wanted to end the corrupt practices of the police officers and in order to end this corruption which became rampant among the police officers, he raised the salary of these police officers in order to end the corruption among them. And he also introduced the system of rewards for those police officers who had rendered meritorious service. Earlier, the Semindars who used to wield police powers, now the police powers of the Semindars were completely taken away and it was given to the office, police officers appointed by the British. Under the police reform introduced by Lord Cornwallis, each district was divided into areas of 400 square miles. This each area of 400 square mile was placed under an officer called a police superintendent, in whom the police powers were vested. Now, the major revenue reforms introduced by Lord Cornwallis. In 1787, he divided Bengal into a number of fiscal areas for the purpose of the collection of revenue. Each area was placed under a collector. He supervised the collection of revenue in his district. The number of districts was reduced during the period of Warren Hastings. The number of districts was 36. Lord Cornwallis is reduced it to 23. There was an old committee of revenue during the period of Warren Hastings, which supervised the collection of revenue and settled the revenue. But now it got renamed as a board of revenue. This board of revenue supervised the collectors. Earlier, the collectors were supervised by the committee of revenue during the period of Warren Hastings. Now, the committee of revenues powers were given to board of revenue, which now began to control and supervise the district collectors in the collection of revenue. Commercial reforms introduced by Lord Cornwallis. His first attention was it to suppress corruption in the commercial department, which also witnessed corruption. With the establishment of Board of Trade at Calcutta in 1774, during the period of Warren Hastings, this Board of Trade was created for the purchase of indigenously manufactured products for its sale in Europe. This company procured this Indian manufactured goods through European and Indian contractors, but these contractors used to sell poor quality manufactured goods to the board of trade at higher prices by bribing the members of the board of trade. It was a corrupt practice. Lord Cornwallis reduced the number of members of the board of trade from 11 to 5. This board of trade used to purchase on behalf of the company low quality prices at low quality goods at higher prices. Now, the, for the purchase of 
indigenously manufactured products for sale in Europe, Lord Corn Valley is created board of trade, commercial residents and agents were created, board of trade was discontinued and in the place of board of trade, commercial residents and the agents were created for the procurement of indigenously manufactured products for its further sale in Europe. These commercial residents and the agents directly decided the prices of the commodity. They also checked the quality of the manufactured products sold. Now, with the creation of the commercial residents and the agents, the company got good manufactured products at a low price. Suppression of corruption during the period of Warren Hastings, corruption and private trade were rampant. Lord Cornwallis, once he became the Governor General, turned his attention towards the suppression of the bribery and the misuse of the Dastaga or the duty pass for private trade by the company officials. He also forbade the officials of the English East India Company from accepting bribes as well as the presence. They were also required to declare his property under oath before they proceeding to Britain. Cornwallis was aware that the corruption was rampant due to the low salary of the officials. So, he turned his attention to hike the salary of the officials. Initially, he decided to hike the salary of the collectors, whose salary was hiked to 1500 rupees per mensum. And in addition to the collectors were given 1 percent additional allowance based on the revenue they collected. These measures were undertaken by Lord Cornwallis to prevent corrective measures. Europeanization of services. In all higher posts, Britishers were appointed, Indians were not given the due share in the higher services of the company. He had a very low opinion about the ability and integrity of the Indians following which he reserved all higher posters exclusively for the British. Indians were not appointed into covenanted or higher civil service. In the army, even with the great fighting capacity and value, Indians could rise only up to the post of Subedar. All other higher posters were exclusively reserved for the British. In civil service, Indians got appointment only up to the post of Munsip or Sadar Amin or deputy collectors. All other higher posters, covenanted services were exclusively reserved for the British. He did not give any attention to the idea of son of soil. It was during the period of Warren Hastings, there existed quinquennial system or a five year revenue settlement. He was introduced to revenue farmers on contract. After the failure of this quinquennial settlement, Warren Hastings introduced annual settlement. This quinquennial as well as annual settlement introduced by Warren Hastings ended in failure because these revenue farmers or the contractors who had failed to collect the revenue which they had promised when getting this contract. Actual cultivators were exploited by these revenue farmers by collecting highest amount of revenue. It also resulted corruption, even the officials of the English East India Company took a contract 
for the collection of land revenue. This annual settlement introduced by Warren Hastings continued till 1790. In 1790, mild changes were introduced by Lord Cornwallis in this annual system of settlement. He began to recognize Semintars who had taken the contract for the collection of revenue as the owner or the proprietor of the land. Later he made a 10 year settlement with the Semintars. But in 1793 he made it permanent. A permanent settlement was made by Lord Cornwallis in 1793. Cornwallis introduced this permanent land revenue system of settlement because this quinquennial five or five year as well as the annual settlement, it had only declined agriculture and impoverished the country. It was failed to produce large quantities of goods especially as raw material to feed the machines in Britain such as silk and cotton. The production of cotton and silk which went down during the period of this quinquennial and the annual settlement introduced by Warren Hastings. And in addition to that Lord Cornwallis considered that it was an oppressive taxation system which resulted the impoverishment of the peasants. Because of all these reasons, he introduced the permanent land revenue system of settlement in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa in 1793. Why did Lord Cornwallis introduce the permanent land revenue system of settlement? He viewed certain merits behind the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement. What were the merits Lord Cornwallis had seen through the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement and whether he was able to achieve these merits. One, Lord Cornwallis saw that through the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement, corruption could be ended. Since the land tax was fixed, the Semindar and the British were well aware the what amount each Zemindar was it to pay. So, there was no scope of corruption. Secondly, since the land tax was fixed, even if the income from agriculture was increased, the revenue demand of the state remained fixed. The state did not come forward to appropriate the surplus production in the form of tax. Lord Cornwallis believed that the surplus production would be used for improving the agriculture by these semintars. This was a system which had been in existence in Britain. The semintars or the landholders would invest surplus money for improving the agriculture. In addition, over and above the permanent land revenue system of settlement would provide a permanent income to the English East India Company. Even if there was natural calamities leading to crop failure, the company would get, get its tax regularly. There was no reduction of tax was made even during natural calamities. So, a regular and a fixed income the English East India Company would get through the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement. These were the merits behind the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement by Lord Cornwallis. With whom did Cornwallis make the settlement? It was a settlement with the Semintars, not with the actual tillage of the soil. 
he belonged to the landed aristocracy in Britain. That is why he was in favor of introduction of a settlement giving ownership of land to the Semintars. He mistakenly believed that the Semintars would improve the land as the case in Britain. And the government did not have any option other than making the settlement with the Semintars. Why? Because there were 4 to 5 million cultivating families in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. Was it possible for the British to make a settlement with these 4 to 5 million agricultural families? Not pos it was not possible and preparing the amount each cultivator was it to pay would take long years of work. Over and above had such a system been introduced, it would increase corruption. With the introduction of the permanent land revenue system of settlement, it was easy for the British to collect the amount from a small number of big semindars. These big semindars in turn collected land tax from the actual cultivators. From these actual cultivators, the semindars collected tax and paid to the British. These semindars served as intermediary. It was an intermediary, original cultivator, peasant and the British. Semindar who used to collect tax from the peasants and paid to the British. So, the settlement was made by the British with the, these semindars who was in responsible for the collection of land tax directly from the peasants. For this purpose, Lord Cornwall is made the semindars as the owners of land. Earlier, these peasants who had enjoyed ownership or the proprietorship of land under this settlement. Semindars emerged as the owners of land. The Semindars had to pay the tax to the British, not to the peasants. The Semindars collected land tax only from the peasants. If the Semindar collected land tax from the cultivator and paid it to the British, he was it to be the owner of the land. He could sell mortgage or transfer it. Since the ownership was vested with the semindar, it was possible for the semindar to sell mortgage or transfer it. After the death of the semindar, it was inherited by his family member. But if the semindar failed to collect the land tax, from the cultivators and pay to the British, then his semindari right or the ownership of land would be taken away by the British and would be sold to the highest bidder at public auction to a new semindar or to a new owner. It means that the semindars did not enjoy absolute right on their semindari. Now, coming to the condition of the peasants, with this permanent land revenue system settlement, who became the owners of land? The semindars became the owners of land. The peasants lost ownership of land. Earlier, these peasants or the actual cultivators enjoyed ownership of land. Now, with the introduction of the permanent land revenue system settlement, the ownership of the persons lost. They became a mere tenant of the semindar. They could be evicted by the semindar at any point of time. Corn Valley's had instructed that each semindar should issue 
a patta or an agreement a written agreement mentioning the amount of tax each cultivator had to pay, but none of the zamindars were issued these kinds of written agreements given to the peasants. So, the peasants were not aware of the amount of tax he had to pay, he used to pay the tax determined by the zamindar. If the British determined 100 rupees as tax, the Semindar would usually collect 150 rupees as tax from the cultivator. The cultivator was not aware of the amount of tax to be paid, since the non issuance of the patta or the return agreements showing the amount of tax to be paid by the peasants. So, it resulted malpractices in the collection of land tax by the semindar from the peasants. So, the semindar the land tax was fixed permanently. So, the land tax was high and in addition to that the semindars made extra payment from the peasants. Now, the cultivators became at the mercy of the semindar. The land tax was fixed so high because the tax was fixed permanently. So, in addition to this tax, the semindars also collected extra amount. According to Sir John Shure, a knowledgeable company official, he gives a graphic account of the amount these peasants got through cultivation and in what amount they paid to the semintar and what amount the British received as tax from the semintar. For example, if a cultivator produced crop worth 100 rupees, 45 rupees went to the British government as tax, the tax was 45 percent, it was so fixed high. Officially 15 rupees to the semintar, but the semintar used to collect more money from the peasants rather than fixed by the British government. Only 40 rupees was spent to the actual cultivator. Since it was an oppressive taxation system, it could be collected only by using oppressive methods. In normal circumstances, the peasants were unlikely to pay this high amount of tax. So, the Samindars resorted oppressive methods for the collection of land tax. Otherwise, the Samindars would not be in a position to collect this land tax from this actual cultivators and if he failed to collect land tax from the peasants, his semindari rights would be taken away by the British and sold it to the new bidder. By regulations passed in 1793, 1799 and 1812, the semind these regulations empowered the semindar to take away the property of the cultivator if he had failed to pay land tax. This was the legal method of oppression. In addition to that, illegal oppressive measures were also adopted by the semindars for the collection of these oppressive tax from these cultivators. They engaged the semindars engaged locking up or beating the tenants. These illegal methods were used by the semindars for the collection of tax from these peasants if they failed to pay. So, this permanent land revenue system of settlement 
introduced by Lord Cornwallis made the life of the peasants highly miserable. In addition to these miserable conditions, these peasants were also exploited by another group. It was money lenders. How did money lenders exploit the peasants? As you have been told earlier, the land tax was fixed and there was no change in this tax even during natural calamities. The peasants had no option other than paying the land tax determined by the semindars. So, during the natural calamities, these peasants borrowed money from the money lenders for the payment of land tax. If the crop was good in the next year, the money the cultivator was able to repay his past debt taken from the money lenders. But if the crop was not good, he would get into debt trap, which went from generation to generations. Effect on the semintars, how did this permanent land revenue system settlement affect the semintars? As you have been told earlier, this even though the semintars became the owners or the proprietors of land, they did not enjoy absolute right on this land. If the semindars had failed to collect taxes on time from the peasants, his semindari rights would be taken away by the British and auctioned to the highest bidder in public auction. Under this, 68 percent of the semindari lands were taken over by the British during the period between 1794. In this period, 68 percent of the semindars had failed to pay tax from the peasants. And during this period, spanning between 1794 and 1819, 68 percent of the semindari rights were taken over by the British and sold it in public action who were the new buyers, merchants, government officials and other semintars brought to these lands. Once a new land was bought, the next attention was to increase the rents paid by the cultivators in order to make a profit from this purchase. Still, all these practices were employed, but certain semindars, even after resorting all these legal and illegal methods of the collection of land tax from the peasants, resorted other methods. Which method did, did they adopt? One such semindar was Raja of Burdwan. He had failed to collect land tax from the peasants for the payment of the British. Following which he divided his, his semindari lands. This came into known as Patni Taluks. This Raja of Burdwan, he had failed to collect tax directly from the cultivators for the payment of British on time, following which he divided his estate into Patni Taluks, after which this unit each Patni Taluk was rendered out to a holder called Patni Dar. This Patnidar who promised to pay 
a fixed amount of rent to this actual semi intar. If this Patni Dar failed to collect land tax from the peasants and pay to this semi Dar, his Patni could be taken away. Following which, following the Raja of Bardwan divided his estate into different Patnis and given to Patni Dars, other semi Dars followed suit. Other semindars also engaged in the division of their lands into different estates and given to party thoughts. It resulted the development of self infudation from the British. The lands were got by semindars and from the semindars it got again divided into Patni Dars and the Patni Dars who actually resorted the collection of land tax directly from the peasants. This resulted the development of self infudation. So, these were the administrative reforms introduced by Lord Convalis during his period as the Governor General from 1786 to 1793. He continued the talks which had left by Warren Hastings. Warren Hastings policies were set correct by Lord Convalis. In conclusion, we say that the revenue policies introduced by Warren Hastings like quinquennial system and later annual system of settlements, all these settlements were ended in failure. And in this place, Lord Convalis introduced permanent land revenue system of settlement. But this permanent land revenue system settlement was also ended in failure. It caused the peasants from taking away their proprietorship or the ownership of the land. These peasants who had earlier enjoyed the ownership of land, now these peasants were reduced to the status of tenants. The condition of the semindars were also different if they had failed to pay taxes to the British on time, their semindari rights were taken away by the British and sold to the new owners in a public auction. So, these permanent land revenue system settlements introduced by the British were ended in transcendent failure. But his judicial reforms, he completed the task of Warren Hastings who left midway all these corrupt practices which had a rampant in the company which had been set right by Lord Convalis. Likewise, the board of trade which was the center of corruption it was also set right, set right by Lord Convalis. So, in conclusion, a Warren, the Warren Hastings task was completed by Lord Convalis. Now, the questions from this topic evaluate the judicial reforms of Lord Convalis. How did the land revenue system of settlement? introduced in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa make the life of the persons miserable, make an estimate of the reforms introduced by Lord Convalis. Thank you students for watching this class. Thank you.
uh, good morning everybody, I am uh, Raghunandan Sengupta. So, I will just give you uh, the a very brief uh, excitement area of finance which is quantitative finance and that has a huge market starting around about 10 years back and it is exploding exponentially. So, what uh, do we mean by quantitative finance? Quantitative finance is actually the application of different mathematical and statistical techniques in the area of financial markets, be it say for example, derivative pricing, be it in the area of say for example, portfolio management, be it in the area of asset liability management, be it in the area of portfolio management. We see that the application has exploded in such a way that there is a huge opportunity for people who have a quantitative background in mathematics and statistics, they can utilize those in the area of finance, but obviously with some prior knowledge of, of, of uh, finance as a subject. Now, when we say about quantitative finance, as I said, it is an area of applied mathematics and statistics applied in, in financial markets. Use of different areas, if somebody is interested to know, we have stochastic calculus, we have derivative pricing, we have operation research, we have quantitative techniques like differential uh, equations, stochastic calculus, time series and they are heavily used in the area of quantitative finance as I mentioned. Now, we all know that in 2000, in 1997, the Nobel Prize in Economics, so it is basically the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was given to the work of Merton and Scholz in the area of derivative pricing. And after that, there has been an exponential increase in the area of, of quantitative techniques in, in, in quantitative finance and the, in the area of, of different type of derivative pricing. With the advent, moreover with the advent of, of high-ended and sophisticated computing data, big data has come in a very big way where application areas starting from computing, from different type of algorithm design have been taken up in such a big way that nowadays at least we are able to understand that how high frequency data algorithm trading can be utilized using the concept of quantitative finance in the area of, of finance as such. But there is a flip side also, obviously when, when, when there is a huge amount of development, so obviously due to some regulation errors or something, there has been some, some pitfalls which I think is should be a bullet point for people who are in really interested to take up quantity finance, they should be aware. So, consider the financial crisis in 2008 and later on and we are seeing different banks are failing, different financial institutions are facing a problem, countries are facing a problem like in Europe, in, 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 in USA. So, what should be done? So, the main thing is that even if you know the technique is best for people who are investors, who are private players, organizations like banks, government should use these techniques in a very somber manner such that the application areas of quantitative finance using the techniques which we learned can be utilized in the best possible way to garner the overall the in-depth knowledge a person has in trying to utilize these quantitative techniques in finance. And I am sure that people who have the background, who have the knowledge, who have the, the sophistication, who have the, the knowledge of the society can definitely use quantitative finance in a very big way in trying to make their mark in this exciting field which you are going to see in years to come. And I am sure it will be a very exciting learning tool for all the participants who, who will take quantitative finance as a, as, a, as a subject in years to come. Thank you and I, am, and I wish all the participants all the best and best of luck for the programs they will take. Thank you.